if we talk about powerlessness, in my imagination, um, uh, an example of powerlessness is the people of Venezuela, a country which is under an authoritarian regime since decades and where uh, many, many people were forced to leave. So when we prepared for the uh, Venice Biennale uh, last year, uh, which is about the relation Switzerland-Venezuela, I wanted to, to, to go to Venezuela and, and see it. Uh, my friend said, don't. You won't get from the airport to the city. So I had a clear image of Venezuela. And somebody said, why don't you call Elisa Silva? She lives there. She will know what to do. And I called Elisa and, and said, yeah, we're thinking of you know, hiring bodyguards and tanks and an escort. And she said, um, uh, we'll rather take my old Renault. So Elisa uh, opened my eyes to Venezuela, to the beauty and the complexity of the countryside, of the city, of the architecture, of, of the culture, of the situation also of, of the people. And, but she also opened my eyes to her work, which is work in the barrio. Uh, she says barrio, she does not say informal settlement. I was even more afraid of visiting a barrio than visiting Venezuela, because people said, you, first you won't get from the airport to the city, and if you go into a barrio, you will not leave it. I felt totally safe there, safer than in many cities. And this was also thanks to uh, Elisa Silva's guidance, but also work. Uh, Elisa is an architect based in Caracas, uh, Venezuela, uh, teaching at various places, currently at the Harvard University and Miami International University. There's other uh, venues, Princeton. You also started the year in ETH Zurich. Um, uh, you've been present at the Venice Biennale two years ago. There's several books. I won't read all the prices. You can do that uh, yourself. Uh, but it's clearly uh, one of the leading voices and practitioners today in the discussion of how to empower the powerless. Thanks for being here, Elisa. Um, thank you so much to the organizers, the hosts, curators of the Engaden Talks uh, for this invitation. Um, Dale Bettler, Romeo Cusini, Christina Bettler, Philipp Wurstblum, uh, Dan Kausain. It is truly a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, so the talk is unlearning in messy fields. And basically, I'd like to share my reflections of practice in architecture that stems from my experiences working in Caracas, Venezuela. This is a city that has a built environment strongly defined by barrios, or self-built neighborhoods. It's where half of the population lives. And it is also powerfully defined by a legacy that is both rich and fraught of modern architecture. For example, the Humboldt Tower, um, for example, the Helicoide, which is this linear strip mall that is a prison and intelligence headquarters today. The Humboldt Tower above the Avila Mountain that goes into and out of expensive stages of renovation and ruin. Parque Central and its empty towers and nearly uninhabitable residences. A highway system that completely divides the city and buries its river. Social massive housing structures that have not created the nurturing and safe environments they promised. So mind you, these uh, rather kind of white elephants are lauded with nostalgia by the architecture community, celebrated at exhibitions like MoMA, not once, but twice, um, with a 50 year span between them, um, as symbols of an ideal time in the country's relationship with design. And whatever shortcomings these projects may have today are always sort of thrust aside to the fault of mismanagement, a corrupt government, deteriorated economy. But I recall a click happened for me uh, years ago when I heard a lecture by writer and architect Federico Vegas, 
who's talking about his own father, Venezuelan architect Martin Vegas, who studied under Mies van der Rohe at IIT in Chicago and designed iconic buildings in Caracas, such as the Torre Polar and its curtain wall facade. Federico, his son, recalls how at a certain point in the late 70s, his father stopped taking any interest in art practicing architecture and instead spending time traveling to small rural towns and drawing their colonial houses. Federico speculates that his father grew disillusioned by the contradiction he saw between the heroism of the architecture he had studied and the self-built city that was so quickly emerging. One billion people live in self-built neighborhoods, one in seven world inhabitants, and some estimates project that by 2030, the proportion will increase to one in four. While the tendency has often been for architects to design and build housing, either state-sponsored or procured as an expensive prefabricated structures, ironically, houses are precisely what settlers build themselves. Over a span of a generation or two, what begins as a modest construction becomes a house, several stories high, embedded in a larger community that has also grown into a consolidated neighborhood, eventually incorporated into a network of services, transportation, public amenities, and seven decades of this sort of self-construction that has happened in Caracas, in Venezuela, in Latin America, um, gives us ample proof that um, self-construction is actually producing a kind of city, right? Um, these are images of La Palomera, which we'll get to know a little bit more. Since the late 50s, John Turner and others were advocating that the barriadas did not need or necessarily be seen as a housing problem. Nonetheless, the design discipline, in spite of kind of all of their research and work, still focuses on housing largely. This is John Turner, an English architect who graduated from the AA in London, and when he was 30, moved to Peru. And there he studied self-built neighborhoods that were growing in Arequipa and Lima. His writings have resonated with me deeply for many years. He, he passed recently in September uh, of last year. And there are three main ideas that I'd like to highlight about Turner's work that helped build a different understanding of the role of the architect and architecture education. So the first is his acknowledgement that Lima's Barriadas taught him to see housing not as a noun, but as a verb. What housing does and how it contributes to people's livelihoods. Housing needs to work, and especially in financial terms. Self-built homes may be precarious, but inexpensive and allow families to save money and progressively improve them with better materials. The key factor being that this is done over time. And while they feed and clothe themselves adequately, this home is also producing income because it allows them to sell products in a bodega on the ground level or to offer some kind of a service like car repair or sewing and tailoring. In contrast, social housing, although of better quality, actually impoverishes the family. Mortgage payments take up too large of a proportion of the income of the family and they become malnourished. They also have lost the money that they would have been making from a ground floor bodega or shop. So in essence, a well-housed family is poorer than one living in a self-built home. This leads to the second finding that Turner talks about. Uh, his term is misplaced pity. People from higher economic echelons and the entrepreneurial classes tend to equate barrios with poverty and insist that the correct solution would be to er eradicate them altogether. <coughs> to accept barrios as a viable way of resolving housing needs, let alone acknowledging them as part of a city, was just unthinkable in the mindset enamored with modernization and progress. And even today, I can give you examples of local authorities and architects who are keep beating at this poor dog it is happening in Santiago de Chile today, which is experiencing high levels of migration and the formation of new campamentos, that's how they call them. State and local governments are committing extraordinary sums to build social housing, while the campamentos grow at a much faster rate. And it is fascinating to see how this very same misplaced pity that Turner identified and a good dose of denial are still live and well. 
quote, good intentions override and project uncalculated fixes to misunderstood situations. The pause needed to observe, listen, and understand where a design professional may be of use is forfeited by a stubborn insistence on formal solutions, in spite of ample proof to the contrary. And the third lesson he leaves us with is the importance of de-schooling, de-schooling the profession. And this is thanks to his friendship and engagements with Ivan Illich, well known for his advocacy of de-schooling. Turner wrote about his experiences and unequivocally credits Limas Barriadas for de-schooling him. In other words, observing the dynamics of self-construction forced him to unlearn what architecture school had taught him. He found it much more relevant to use his talents to support and facilitate the dynamics of self-building rather than continue to participate in the unproductive and harmful art of producing buildings that were impoverishing people. I believe I too was de-schooled and have been, not once, but several times and have left my trail of this process of learning. Um, for example, in two publications, one in 2015, Cava Cartography of the Caracas Barrios, which maps how uh, they grew over a period of 48 years in Caracas, and Pure Space, published in 2020, um, advocating for public spaces and barrios uh, through research that came from the Harvard University Wilwright Fellowship. Um, this happened in eight Latin American cities and as well as uh, my own practice building public spaces. So playgrounds, plazas, squares, in La Palomera, um, in Petare, and in Chapellin, as well as uh, other parts of the city. My most exciting work in Barrios, however, came with a cultural and educational program held in the Barrio La Palomera that uh, we called Integration Process Caracas, awarded by the U.S. Embassy in Venezuela in 2018. We convened a very large interdisciplinary team of artists, journalists, educators, architects, landscape architects, and neighbors, of course, from community and organized many events in the barrio. It began with a manifesto to the complete city where we pledged to acknowledge the barrio as an integral part of the city. We invited people from the entire city to get to know La Palomera, to dance together, to walk together, listen to decimas, which are rhymes, and in this case specifically written about the Barrio La Palomera, and essentially to enjoy culture and the art of being together, physically present in the Barrio. We were welcomed to the celebration of the Cross of May, a tradition the Barrio had observed for decades, and built a one to 200 scale model of the entire neighborhood and its surroundings that was then part of a procession carried through by neighbors and musicians. And then this model was reassembled at the top um, to generate conversations about um, the history and the livelihood of the place. The cross was venerated as is stipulated by the tradition, followed by a well-attended concert and a lot of dancing. And in this case, people from the barrio and elsewhere in Caracas participated there's a drawing that we produced to sort of mem remember this special occasion. Um, and it embodies the procession, but also signifies a particular kind of celebration of the organic fabric of the barrio, its pedestrian scale, and all its nuances. Years of walking in barrios, talking to neighbors, becoming friends with many of them, and being a frequent visitor finally allowed me to understand that my own theses about public spaces, for example, had faults in it. I realized the barrio had its own logic of public spaces and um, that I too had focused on what I believed was lacking until I started to find the corners and the walkways where kids play marbles and the many bocce courts or la petanque um, that populate the barrio. We call them bolas criollas in Venezuela. La Vuelta de los Jeeps, which is where kids play baseball. And this is also where uh, some dance and the elders get together in the evenings for conversations. La Palomera has many, many gardens, a lot of vegetation. And these gardens exist in the windowsills and makeshift pots placed on stairs, 
but so eloquently revealed the pride that neighbors have in uh, their, their barrio. And this was the message that I took to Venice for the Architecture Biennale in 2021. The walkways, stairs, and public spaces of La Palomera, just as they are, are phenomenal public spaces. Exhibited in the middle of the organic fabric of Venice, it was very easy to recognize the crooked paths that make this city. Drawings of the gardens as a kind of necklace of green spaces, and um, each of the gardens and public spaces we recorded as axometric drawings with their very specific species assigned to them, um, also generated 260 species that we uh, surveyed and compiled into this ethnobotanical dictionary, the plants from La Palomera. Two hundred sixty species is a lot. So, in gratitude and acknowledgement of La Palomera's neighbors, who so generously shared their stories about their gardens with us, we fabricated this kind of boîte en valise à la Duchamp of the Venice exhibition that we gifted to them. This work led to many opportunities for transformations, and I will just name two. One was to change how waste is collected returning to decades-old practices of the mochileros, where instead of expecting neighbors to walk to the bottom of the barrio, where there's actually a street, and the waste truck comes by, um, that neighbors would have the opportunity to have their waste collected door to door and avoid this sort of thing, which is the quintessential open air waste container at the bottom of the barrio that marks a very stark contrast between city types and creates this tacit frontier. So um, by eliminating it, we kind of created this opportunity also to just transform that threshold into something that, that flows and, and is, is continuous, and also just making the services equal. The other project is La Casa de Todos. Everyone's house is the translation. So neighbors showed us this space, which had been abandoned for decades, and asked what we could do there. And the key word being we, which was very exciting. So we decided to open the doors and host a party together with the many cultural groups who we had gotten to know and had come to participate in all of these previous events. It was a huge success. And after that, we understood that the place needed to become a permanent, plural, and inclusive space for art, culture, for the community of La Palomera and for the entire city. I love to say that this is a metropolitan center and not a community center. Um, it's been three years in the making. The Swiss Embassy in Venezuela was the first to support us, and I love having this chance to say that. Um, this is an image with Jörg Specker, who was the second ambassador um, during this time period. So know that your taxes sometimes go to very good uses. Um, we took advantage of existing knowledge in the community to produce a bamboo roof, and this bamboo roof now also collects water that is used in the restrooms, kitchen, and gardens, and we taught how it works so that people could replicate it at their homes. Uh, emerging activities began to define how spaces like this could be used. A wall with the map of La Palomera allows kids to locate their homes with great excitement. It's kind of a gesture of acknowledgement. A garden occupies the very center of this house. There are spaces for music classes, storytelling, more gardens. This is Catalina, who Marina knows well. I think she's in the audience here. And um, there's a kitchen for culinary courses, as well as a chocolate making with Maria Fernanda Villaco, who's a very famous chocolate lady in Venezuela. And performances, this is Joropo being danced. Uh, there's a market that happens twice a month, everything for one dollar. A library, um, and enough space for all sorts of gatherings and activities. This is the mayor of Baruta uh, sitting in our, in our little library, which is a library that shares um, books to 
take and keep and bring back. It's um, been growing. And we now have 40 at least weekly events and uh, classes, programs of all sorts, uh, and different entities that take the leadership of those different courses. We have 14 now to date. In December 2023, we presented the end of the year recital with various culture groups, and we had over 100 visitors. So we are definitely now bursting at the seam and have recently acquired the right to use the adjacent building. Um, and although, of course, I am not an objective judge, I would argue that this is one of the liveliest places in Caracas today, and definitely one of the most diverse. Years before, when we wrote the manifesto to the Incomplete City, 2019, we challenged people to look at their stigmas against the barrio, the trope that insists on seeing it as poor and in need. What does the barrio really need, we argue? It needs acknowledgement as part of the city to continue, to continue insisting on its narrative of disease that needs to be cured, does not help see it as a space of livelihood and everything that it does. And so I'm here kind of going back to Turner's idea of housing being a verb and not a noun. And this is the case of the action of, of living. So today, La Casa de Todos is essentially an actant a la Bruno Latour that gives the barrio and its neighbors a voice, a strength, so much so that the model is being copied and emulated in other communities. The space and all its activities shift the power dynamics and assert respect. Furthermore, La Palomera is showing the rest of the city how to encourage and practice inclusion, how to model a socially just and democratic expression of urban livelihood. Richard Sennett speaks at length about the nature of respect uh, in this beautiful publication, Respect in a World of Inequality. And the passage that I highlight here particularly interests me because it could be very much a justification of La Casa de Todos. This is a piece that we made for the Chicago Architecture Biennial, and you're seeing it here at the Fundacion, the Graham Foundation. But basically, respect is forged practicing ambiguous, open-ended rituals, like gardening together, dancing, learning, cooking, planning a celebration. They effectively erode otherness and fear of otherness, and yet are so threatened by the tendency to mon monetize everything into short, finite transactions. So La Casa de Todos is a place of ambiguous, open-ended rituals, and I marvel at how much people enjoy and long for them. The role here for the architect is that of a facilitator, a supporter of dynamics that requires space and some level of organization. And uh, it was then also part of the exhibition uh, called Commons, um, or Commun, at uh, the Arc en Rêve in, in Bordeaux and the Interpol. Um, I'm also convinced that architects need to place less emphasis on control and predictability, and more on co-imagining and co-designing, which allows spaces that are lived to take on more complex meaning and more dimensions. The various programs and users emerge in time and the space adapts. This way of seeing architecture broadens the field and the realm of what is possible. Recalling um, Borges' short story, There Are More Things, which is this short uh, story about um, an encounter with a, a, a being that no one really knows how to kind of define. And it, it's, in, in, in a short way, trying to explain sort of the magnitude and the vastness of uh, encounters and experiences that go well beyond what we've categorized or named. Um, Wittgenstein also alludes to the very same notion as he talks about an immense landscape which we cannot possibly know. And in, in other words, this open and incomplete, ever completing itself form of practice gains complexity and diversity as opposed to the stifling effect that comes from insistence on control and order so often conflated with design disciplines. And often awarded and encouraged. So I kind of just thought I'd venture to offer my own two award-winning, i.e. very controlling projects, um, which was the Sabana Grande Boulevard and the Church San Juan Maria Vianney. 
And this work in La Palomera has given me the kind of confidence to pursue even more daunting challenges such as the poor River Guaire and trying to see how to begin its process of renaturalization and forming a linear park. But this is a story for another time, just a few images. Um, pretty incredible uh, opportunity of eventually having one day 35 kilometers of parks through the city. Cities desperately need spaces where encounters with folks that are different happen regularly, where we can embrace our diversity instead of fearing it, and where we can potentially think of the city together and curate with intention environments that are plural, inclusive, and necessarily complex. The profession needs to support gestures of spatial justice, and I call this engraving of the good architect by French architect Philibert Delorme um, in his 16th century treatise. The architect encourages open structures integrated with lush gardens, firmly standing on the ground with, I don't, I don't know if you can make it out, four hands, three eyes, a little bit of a monster, increased agility and keener vision, better equipped to both register and reproduce complexity. The image is curiously not focusing on form or objects, but on livelihood and harmony. So might architects today actually come closer to the engraving of the bad architect who is missing eyes and hands and utterly unable to handle complexity, roaming ungrounded in a barren landscape surrounded by gates and fortified buildings. A recalibration of the frame and scale of a domain for practice reveals the pertinence of thinking architectural site as an inclusive field, the real in its messiness and unpredictability as a vast arsenal for design. Embraced by implicated architects who see themselves as facilitators and interpreters, this could unleash, unleash unprecedented advances for collective power of encounters and tremendous agility in the art of living together. Merci. Many thanks, many thanks, Elisa, architect with 10 hands and 40 eyes and eight hearts. Uh, we're a little bit tight on schedule as this is the ritual of the Gardin Art Talks, uh, that we try to be Swiss and then go over time and uh, cut the coffee break. But we have time for one question, which I, of course, give to Thomas. So maybe you understood what I said in my first statement, that the, the time today is the Verantwortlichkeitsexplosion. Mm -hmm. It's the, you speak German? Ein bisschen. Ein bisschen, yeah. 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 That was based on the, on the political situation today. Huh? But now if I listen to you, based on the economic situation of Caracas, it's exactly the same word. It's a Verantwortlichkeitsexplosion, because whatever you do in developing your city is based on the individual responsibility of all the people involved. And I think that gives us a little bit the key of all these things we have heard until now. And it came to my mind the Grameen Bank of Yunus, which is also a Verantwortlichkeitsexplosion, because the bank works with thousands and ten thousands of women who collect money and save the money and give credit. So it's also a, an incredible success, a worldwide success, although they want to put them in prison because it's so successful. Huh? But that was just going through my mind and uh, I'm very impressed with what you're doing. I'd like to congratulate you. It, it's fantastic what you can do if you empower people all over a slum. Paradise gets out of it. So you can answer or we, we, we have another question, if you wish. Thank you. Other question. And then we have one third, final question. 
I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on the politics of land ownership because I think in many countries, many cities, power lies with owning real estate and controlling real estate and then the economic value that is derived from that. Here you have a model that seems to ignore land ownership. How does that actually work in practice? Can you sell your house that you've built? Do you pass it on to another generation? So that's the first part of the question. The second one is, what is the reaction from nas the national political scene in Venezuela to this approach? Do they condone it? Do they support it? Do they ignore it? So two questions, I apologize. Okay, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, yes, I think land is an a important question. Mute at this point in Venezuela because, as Philip mentioned, a quarter of the country lives outside of Venezuela now, so we have um, what one of my colleagues calls osteoporosis, like we have many buildings that are empty, so there is no real pressure on real estate or land at the moment. And in the future when that could happen, I believe a beautiful precedent is one that I know in Puerto Rico, where a um, informal settlement, which I, as you said, don't like to use, a self-built neighborhood, um, consolidated themselves as a, as a land trust. And that gives them a great deal of resilience from being you know, bought up property by property and convert it into something else because they tend to be very well located in the city. And so um, I'm actually part of a beautiful art community called A-Field and having uh, the you know, grace of those connections, other people who have been li looking into these kinds of communal land transformations um, could, could be a way to you know, work ahead of schedule and try to get something like that for maybe La Palomera first and then other communities to, um, to secure their, their land tenureship. And then the politics part is a really complicated um, situation. The land that, the, the, the property that we use belongs to the local municipality, so we have a, a long-term lease from them for zero dollars, basically. So they are supporting, not in monetary form, but you know, that space is quite a lot, so. Um, hope that answers. Thank you. W one last question, short question to Jörg Stolmann. Yeah. Thank you. Um, no, I really admire your practice and I really love your books, publications. Um, but I was wondering, like, when you talk about the community for one thing in uh, Barrio, I think there must be many different kind of communities and there must be conflicts. There must also be conflicts about, you know, how you deal with ownership rights, use rights, and... Um, I cannot help but sometimes think that there's a certain, like when you present it like this and you show your pr kind of success, yeah. that there's a certain kind of you know, feeling of a certain kind of na naivety of the people you work with. And I would have loved if you had a short story of maybe like conflict within the progress of your projects to really show how much of an effort it is as an office to engage in this kind of field and to deal with also you know, the difference and the diversity of the communities you engage with. Yes, thank you for that question. It's a, uh, many prongs to answering it, but um, one part that is important, yes, the, uh, the communities of self-built neighborhoods are different depending on how old they are. So La Palomera is a very old community. It was started in 1937. So you have many generations who have uh, you know, migrated from the countryside into the city and then their children go to school, or maybe many to universities. And so because the sense of um, rootedness there is so strong, people don't necessarily, as m one might suspect, think that they want to leave and go to the non-barrio part of the city. Many actually love staying and are doctors and lawyers and professionals, right? So that creates a very safe neighborhood, ultimately, especially because also those who settled it were cousins and friends, and so you have a street like the DS's street, and then, you know, they're um, also very adept at conviviality. So conflicts do arise, and we have, have a very polarized political situation, and there are both parties represented in, in La, Parume, La Palomera and all communities, but they are so much better than, say, my building, the condominium that we have in the building that I live in, uh, the ability of those folks to get along and resolve things is far less agile 
than the neighbors of La Palomera who are um, very well trained in that. And so they make compromises and, you know, the music's too loud or, but um, we ha I've, I've just like chapeau to them all the time. Be there's also the juez de paz, which is a peace judge. So it doesn't go to court or anything like that. They have a kind of a space to go and talk things through. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess I, I tend to weigh in on the positive and there are conflicts for sure. I could talk about it at other points, but um, by and large, um, at least in the art of living together, they have a lot up on the rest of us. Yeah. Thank you very much. We will have a coffee break. We will gather again at 10 to 12 to hear uh, Rasha Salti. And thanks and chapeau and applause to Elisa Silva. Thank you.